He said, oh, God's got some awesome things he's going to do. He's going to start it tonight. My job right now is to introduce my dear brother, Brother David Harabedian. I met David through his precious mom, who I was her pastor for many years. And uh, over the years, uh, we would pray for David. David, don't mind me saying to me talking to you. He was at Harvard. That's when he was in prison. We call that Harvard. <laughs> and uh, we would pray. And, and we would lift up David. And we would send him all kinds of stuff. And of course, David got born again in Harvard and become an evangelist. God used him mightily. God sent his son Jesus to appear to him, start his prison ministry, which is in thousands of prisons now. Bible's going out all over the place. And we've had a part in that. We're so thankful for to be a part of David's life. And I'm so thankful for the gracious opportunity of, of uh, to know him and to pray together and preach together and see God do marvelous things in many places. And, uh, I won't say any more. I'll let him tell it as God wants him to. we got a precious presence of the Lord tonight. I don't know what all David's going to do, but it'll be good. But I want you to meet my dear brother, Brother David Harabee, and give him a warm clap for him. Praise the Lord. Wow, that's a loud one. Goodness gracious. Thank you, Pastor Dan. That's a man of God right there. He is the real deal. I want to go pray with him at his house for the first time down in his prayer bunker. And when I got there, I realized that's the type of place and that's the type of man of God that you've got to get prayed up before you go pray with. <laughs> and I mean that in all seriousness. There's a lot of angelic activity that takes place in his house. I took a businessman to his home. Not a lot of people uh, get invited over to Dan's house. And it was a divine appointment. I think I've taken two people there in three and a half years. And we got over there and uh, this uh, businessman wasn't really used to uh, angelic activity like some are. And uh, as the three of us were praying in the basement, I felt the presence of angels. And so uh, as angels will often gather around while you're praying, they'll put their hands on your shoulders and you'll feel that angelic touch, that angelic presence. And I felt the presence of angels and I felt the hand of God, and the hand of the angel on me. And, and I looked over and uh, my friend who wasn't used to that, he was in prayer and he went, that strange look on his face. And he thought, there's six hands, there's three of us, but I feel a seventh hand. And you could just see, and I looked over and I kind of smiled, and he's like, I just kind of snickered and closed my eyes. And I looked up a minute, and he looked on the other shoulder, and he's looking at me, he's kind of a little freaked out. We laugh about that now, but he wasn't laughing at the time. But if you ever go to Dan Bowler's house, you ever get around him at a church and you go into the prayer room, get prayed up before you go pray. Amen? You got to get prepared before you pray. Amen. How quickly can God change your heart? How quickly can God change your heart? It can happen in an instant. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. How quickly, how quickly can God change your heart? Say amen when you get there. Verse 7. Amen. Chapter 10. Keynote verse for tonight is verse 6. And this is the promise that was given unto King Saul, who wasn't a king at the time. He was out looking for donkeys. 
You can be out looking for donkeys. And the Lord can get a hold of you. And he can change your heart. Just like that. First Samuel chapter 10 verse 6. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you will prophesy with them. And you will be turned into another man. The born again experience will take out that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He will put a new spirit within you. He will put his spirit within you and supernaturally he will move you from the inside out to follow his decrees and to keep his commands. I was in a cell in Leavenworth Penitentiary. The year was 1990 and God visited me. I was in for stolen jet airplanes and multi-kilogram quantities of cocaine for the Kali cartel. I was way out there. The devil started me with two grams of cocaine in a sale in a parking lot of a grocery store for two $100 bills. And it was a 15 second transaction. And I was slowly cooked like a lobster from cold water with the heat being turned up. And over a period of time, it took that long. Weeks went into months, months went into years before the enemy of my soul, the enemy of your soul, had deceived me into thinking wrong was right and right was wrong. And the next thing you know, I was arrested at a private airfield in Boca Raton, Florida with a stolen jet airplane, a bag of cash, and a Mercedes Benz. And I did not pass go. I did not collect $200. I went to jail that day, directly to jail for the next 19 years, six months, a week, and a day. And during that time, I'm going to share with you what happened in that prison cell in 1990. God came to me. And he changed me in an instant. And by his grace, what I was, I no longer was through the born again experience. The spirit of God came on me. And the things that I used to like to do became repulsive to me. Tonight, God is wanting to visit you in a new way. If you'll turn with me, and I just want to read in context here, Saul is out looking for donkeys. He goes to the prophet, gives him a piece of money so that he can prophesy where the donkeys are at. He went looking for the prophet for one thing, but he got something from the prophet he didn't even ask for. He got a calling from God because in an instant, God changed his heart. 1 Samuel 10, 6. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them. With who? With the prophets. When you get around certain people, anointing comes by association. Impartation comes by association. When you hang out with good people that are anointed, that anointing will come off of them and onto you and you'll be transformed into another man. Be careful who you hang around. You might become like them because the anointing comes by association. When you're in this church, when you're with Pastor Gary Koziki, there's an anointing on him. You'll be convicted under righteousness. The things that used to be strongholds in your life will fall off. You'll be changed into another man, another woman. The things that you used to like to do, you no longer like to do. The things you used to hate to do, you'll begin to love to do. What will happen is your CD collection will change. The things that used to be that which would draw you no longer draw you. That which would draw you no longer draw you. And you think to yourself, what was it that ever could have attracted me to that thing or to that person or to those activities? When people begin to text message you and you've been changed into another man and you look at the text message, that which used to be funny is no longer funny. Because when you grin, you're in and you're no longer smiling and you begin to write back, wrong number. 
Amen. Amen. Because the same way the anointing comes by association and you can go up a level or two by hanging out with the right people. Amen. You can also drop a level or two by hanging out with the wrong people. Because be not deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. And remember, the same way I got cooked like a lobster in a pot, where it was cold water to start with, and the heat began to slowly get turned up, I did not even know I was changing colors right. and getting cooked. You know, lobsters look different in cold water. They have a different color when they get cooked. You ever seen a lobster shell change from a, a kind of a gray to a bright orange? Yeah. That means that lobster is done. See, when you got baptized in the blood of Christ, you got changed into yeah. another color. Right. See, it'll happen one direction or the other, and the direction you go is your choice. When you're leaning into God, you get transformed into the nature and likeness of the Son of God by the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. Yes, sir. It happens as you behold yeah. Him. Yeah. But if you behold something else, you'll be changed into the image and likeness of that. Yes. What image have you been beholding? If I was to look through your phone, I could tell you. If I was to look through your emails, I could tell you. If I could look through your record collection, I could tell you. Yes, sir. Emulation is the highest form of praise. Tonight, as people began to worship in the wedding garments, they began to do it because they see the unseen one. And they're transformed into his image. It may not change you physically on the outside, but there's a change that happens on the inside and that his presence begins to rest upon you because the presence comes by relationship, but the anointing comes for work. That's true. That's right. Amen. Yes, it does. The presence represents relationship. You can have the presence and not the anointing. You can have the anointing and not the presence. But isn't it good to have both? Yeah. You can have the gifts and not have the character or the fruit. You can have the fruit and not operate in the gifts. Don't you know that his desire is for you to have all the fullness of God? That you might be prepared unto every good work, a vessel of honor, fit for the master's use? You can have both. Tonight I'm here to tell you there is more and it can happen in an instant. 1 Samuel 10 6 and the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You can study you can seek him you can hang out with the right people and that's all good. You can attend church you can be on the front row three days a week and that's all good but until the spirit of the Lord comes upon you you're not changed into another man Tonight, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come on some people, and he you're going to be changed. You're going to be turned in an instant. And those things that have been strongholds in your life are going to be broken by the power of the Holy Ghost. Not by power of men, nor by might, nor persuasive words of men's wisdom, but by demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men's words. Or the cunning craftiness of men, or a nice sermonette for the Christianette, or homiletics, or hermeneutics, or any of that stuff, but rather the power of God. By the way, that was excellent worship. I got caught up in the spirit on my knees. God is good. God is good. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is what Jesus said. He said, wait here, tarry here. It's all about the Spirit transforming us. It's His ability, not our ability. It's our availability that releases His ability to fill us. There was an illustration the Holy Spirit gave me one time. He had me take a glass of tea. And what the T represented was not T. It represented dirty water. And I said, here we have a glass of dirty water. 
I said, who would like to drink it? Nobody raised their hand. I said, here we have a glass of clean, fresh mineral water. Who would like to drink it? Many people raised their hand because they had a thirst. I said, well, here's what we often do in the body of Christ when we come to the altar. I took an empty glass. Or actually, I took the, the tea, the dirty water, and I poured half of it out. And so we had half a glass of dirty water. I took a nice, clean pitcher, and I began to pour nice, clean water into the dirty water. And now, it was diluted dirty water. And I said, now who would like to drink this water? Nobody raised their hand. And so I poured some more out. And I poured some more clean water. But again, that was a mixture. Say mixture. You see where we're going here? And nobody wanted to drink the water that was a mixture. Because it had something in it that was impure. But here's what we do at the altar. We come to the altar and we say, Lord, fill me up. Here's my cup. But we don't empty ourselves out of the things that would mix with the anointing. And then we want people to drink that from our lives and wonder why they don't get saved. Truth be known, if they got saved when we were like that, they probably had to get backslide just to get the fellowship with us. Point to ponder. Anyway, what I did was I, I took the cup and I finally emptied it completely out. And I took a little clean water and rinsed it and put it out. And then I poured out of the pitcher. The greater filled the lesser. And I said, who would want to drink of this water? And everybody raised their hand. You want to know why ministries sometimes aren't as effective as they could be? It's because we have a mixture. Tonight, God wants to do something. He wants to get those final things out of us. And guess how quick he wants to do it? In an instant. Not by power or by mind, but by my spirit. How did it happen to the disciples? How did they go from scared men running for their lives, denying Christ, going to and fro when he's on the cross? The only one that you see hanging out is John. Where was Peter? He was denying Christ three times. Aren't you that Galilean? No, I'm not him. Wasn't that the same Peter that said, Lord, all the men did, all men deny you, I will never deny you. Aren't you that Galilean? I told you I wasn't him. Let me give you a few choice words, Peter said, so you know I'm not him. Let me give you some that I learned on the fishing boat. Oh, how quickly we can forget who we are. But God. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is Jesus in the resurrected state. In the resurrected state. Anybody know Jesus? Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And this is the promise. And most of you know this verse by heart. But tonight we're going to experience it. Jesus said, but you, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, it's you. Look at him and say, it's your night. Just look at him and say, do you really believe it? If you believe it, you can receive it. It's time to make room. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That word shall in the Greek is a command. You can't stop it if it's a command from heaven. What's the key on our side? We have to open the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I will come in. This is not a John 3.16 message tonight. Acts 2.4 no more. This is an Acts 1.8 message. And you shall receive power when the Holy
Holy Ghost is come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. The word for martyr or the word for witnesses is the word for martyr. It's the Greek word in the Koine which means martus. It means this power that's coming upon you will empower you, enable you to be willing to be martyred for Christ. Let me share something with you. I can tell you whether or not you've got that power in you by a couple of identifying marks. Are you willing to die for his name when people begin to speak ill of Christians or Christianity? Are you willing to die to yourself and not, not concerned about what they'll say when you take a stand for Christ? If you're not willing at this level, you're not willing to die for him on the next level. This is where the rubber meets the road. What are you going to do when they come for you? Christian, they're coming. They came for him on the day of Pentecost because they were hiding in an upper room because they were scared to death. There was 120 of them, men and women. Let me ask you a question. How many of them had been had an encounter with Jesus? Multitudes were healed. 5,000 were fed. Plus women and children. On two separate occasions that we know of. Water to wine. The maimed, the lame, the hall, the blind were healed. How many were waiting on the day of Pentecost for the power? See, you can get a touch from Jesus and still not have the power. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost... And with power. Jesus, Luke 4, 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, was led or driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. For 40 days he ate nothing. And he overcame the temptations during a time of prayer and fasting alone in the wilderness where God gets the wild in us. And after he overcame the temptations, this is what it says in Luke 4, 14. And Jesus, who was filled with the Holy Spirit in Luke 4, 1, says this. He returned in the power of the Spirit and he went about doing good. And he began to heal and a great fame spread abroad about him. You may have been filled with the Holy Ghost, but have you yet been released in the power? Have you been endued with power from on high? Do the sick get healed when you lay hands on people? Do creative miracles happen? Do demons come out when you walk by and you recognize activity in people? You might have the discerning of spirits, but do you have the power to deal with the spirits that are in them that you discern? You might walk by the mirror and see one. Sometimes deliverance starts at home. You can practice on yourself. Come out in the name of Jesus. Tell the truth and shame the devil. See, I don't know your thought lives, unless the Holy Spirit reveals it, but I don't know your thought lives, but you do. And we love to preach messages to other people, but sometimes you've got to preach to the man or the woman in the mirror. And once you get delivered and you've overcome it in your life by the power of the Holy Ghost, when you walk around other people that have what you used to have as a problem... Instead of being judgmental to him because you're in abstinence. You're in abstinence, but you're not in deliverance. You're clipping down the dandelions every day, doing sin maintenance. 
But only Jesus can go down and get them by the root. They, once you get them by the root, they don't pop back up. And let me share something else with you. When you get truly delivered, let me share with you what happens. When you see somebody bound up in that same thing, you look and you say, Oh Lord, have compassion on them. Because he had compassion on you. When you're really not delivered, but you're abstaining, you're saved, but you wish you weren't. <laughs> You're abstaining, but you're not deliberate. You've got sin management. You get real religious. You see, you get victory for a little while. You see somebody else in the same problem you're abstaining from. You're judgmental because you're self-righteous. But when you get delivered, you know you didn't deliver yourself. It was an encounter with the living God who came into the cell with you and set you Free from the chains in an instant. Religion will tell you you can do it. Just try harder. Relationship says I've done it for you, son. I've done it for you, daughter. I was hung up for your hang-ups. I can touch with the feeling of your infirmities. It's not your ability. Remember, it's your availability. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Fill it up and make me whole. We're going to empty ourselves out before the night's over. There's going to be an invitation for that, and there's going to be impartation. Something you didn't pay a price for, you're going to get for free. Let me share something with you. Impartations can come for free. You'll pay a price after you get one. Do you really want it, or are you content? Or are you in a place where you're satisfied with what you've got, or are you dissatisfied and you want more of Him? <laughs> you remember the story when when Jesus was about to be born, and 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 Mary and Joseph when they they went because there was a census, and they went to the inn. But there was no room at the end. You know, years later, I imagine that innkeeper wishes he'd made room. Don't wait for years and regret that you didn't make room when Jesus was passing by and he wanted to come in. But you were busy but you were busy making money. You were busy with other things. And there was no room at the end of your life, innkeeper. Because you're the innkeeper of your temple. And you can make room if you desire. And if you desire, you'll clean that stuff up. Lay it down. He'll come in. And he will make his abode there. And you shall receive. Salvation is free. The anointing will cost you everything. Acts chapter 1 8, you shall receive power. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9. There was a man called Saul in the New Testament, but he got a name change on the road to Damascus. See, it happens in an instant. Saul chapter 9, Acts 9. Acts 9. Is, this, is this okay? Are we, we flowing okay? Amen. Yes. Come, Holy Spirit, to the next level, we pray. Yes. yes. Visit us, visit us, visit us. Visit us, visit us, visit us, visit us. Just raise your hands up unto the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, 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 come. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way, have your way, have your way, have your way, have your way. God is marking people right now. He's marking people. He's marking them. He's marking them. He's marking them. Lord, release the mark of the ink horn of the Lord upon that forehead. Thank you, Jesus. People are concerned about the mark of the beast. Get focused on the mark of the Lord. Because if the mark of the Lord comes upon you with the ink horn of the Lord, you don't need to fear the mark of the beast. 
multiplying fish and loaves and things will come forth from your hands because you're not one who just knows the acts of the Lord. You know his ways and his acts now flow through you unto the people. Mark them, Lord. Mark them, Lord. Mark them, Lord. Mark them, Lord. Mark them. Mark those that are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Say, Lord, mark me. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. We're shifting, we're shifting, we're shifting. We're going to go to Ezekiel 9 for a second. Ezekiel chapter 9, if you will. Praise God. Have you been marked? Have you been marked? <sighs> and he cried also. This is Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 1. And he cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, every man with his destroying weapon in hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed in linen. Say linen. Linen, linen stands for righteousness. With a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen. Which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, through the midst of the church in Montague, Michigan. Let's make it personal. This isn't an academic teaching. This isn't just another message to take notes on to preach to somebody else. This is about you and him personally. It's about being changed into another person. It's about the Spirit of God coming upon you. Endued with power from on high. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, through the midst of Montague, Michigan, at the Rock Church, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men and women that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in America. Praise the Lord. Something's beginning to happen. For all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Verse 5. And to the others he said in my hearing. Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man or woman upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary, says the Lord. Say long, pause, and reflect. We got John 3.16. We're born again, aren't we? Yeah. Right? It's time to move forward. It's time to take the next step. Well, David, what is the next step? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the next step is all the way. Are you about to buy the field? When a man saw the field, he sold everything he had and he bought the field. Christian, they're coming for you. What are you going to do when they come for you? Are you going to have the same power when they started to come for them in the upper room? But something had happened to them. They had been changed from being fearful and running 
from the world, hiding in an upper room. When power came upon them, they were no longer afraid of the world because they came running out and tongues of fire had separated upon each of their heads and they had been filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues and they began to get up and Paul, Peter said, this is not <coughs> drunken men, but this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel in the last days. Say the God. Look at your neighbor say last days. I want to share something with you. If the power of God came at Pentecost, came at Pentecost, and the prophecy is for the last days, are we closer? To the last days now than we were 2,000 years ago? Yes. yes. Does God always save the best wine for the last? Yes. yes. Did Jesus say greater works will you do than these because I go to the Father? Yes. We need to change our thinking. Change our paradigm. The glory is coming. I said the glory is coming. Yes. The glory is coming. Where they're not able to stand up by reason. They can't minister because of the cloud, the Shekinah glory of his presence. When all bets are off. When you no longer have to lay hands on the sick because they get healed in the glory. The creative miracles begin to happen. Teeth begin to get repaired. I got, I got white gold in my mouth recently during a service. A friend of mine came in and he said, anybody have tooth pain? I said, well, yeah, I got a dental appointment. Didn't have any dental work done in about 35 years. Had some 35-year-old amalgam. It's a mixture of silver and mercury. I don't think it's the healthiest thing to put in your mouth. They're figuring that out now. But we didn't know back then. But thank God that amalgam lasted me through 20 years of prison. But you know what's interesting? This thing shifted after I got out of the wilderness. There was no longer the manna daily and the water from the rock. I had to go out and make a living. The burden of freedom can be sometimes too much for people. I said the burden of freedom can be too much. You got three hots and a cot in prison. They got discipline in there. If you don't show up to work, they kind of find another place for you. They put you in a place called the hole. Little solitary housing unit. Give you time out so you can be with Jesus. <laughs> but when you get out, nobody comes in and wakes you up. Nobody makes you stand up at four o'clock count. You gotta go out and get a job. And if you don't show up for work, they don't take an excuse. You don't get your job back and make 12 cents an hour. <laughs> the burden of freedom can be too much sometimes. And that's why people go back to bondage because they can't handle the freedom in Canaan land where you don't get the pots of meat, the leeks, the oils, the, bo the onions, and the garlic made for you. You got to go out and harvest the land yourself. Can I get a witness? I'm going to share something with you. There's a great blessing at this facility right here. This man of God and the people under his authority do the gospel. The hungry are fed. The sick are healed. Miracle ministers, preachers and teachers and evangelists of the word come through here and release gifts and mantles and anointings. They're doing the gospel here. In America... Many can't handle the burden of freedom. And that's why they've signed on to certain entitlements. All they have to do is yield up their soul. Two types of people left in America. Those that work for a living and those that vote for a living. I'm going to get off of that. 
doesn't matter where you're at today. It's where God wants to take you to. And you need an impartation. Acts chapter 9, and we're going to close. There's more. God wants to give you more. Thank you. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Again, I say, they're coming for you. Are you going to have something for them? The love of Christ? The power of the Holy Ghost? Or are you only going to be an anemic Christian that's going to say, okay. In Acts chapter 1, they were afraid of the world. But in Acts chapter 5, they sat in Solomon's porch. And the world was afraid of them. There's got to be a shift. They weren't afraid of the, the, the disciples because they had weapons that were natural. The Romans had greater weapons than the disciple did in the natural, but they couldn't compete against the weapons they had in the spirit. And that's what I'm talking about. Yes, true. It's good. Come on, I need some dental work. As I opened my mouth that night, about a month ago, I started to taste metal in my mouth. And I thought, well, that's strange. God's man of faith and power and discernment. I thought, maybe I ought to get one of these Listerine breath tabs and put it in my mouth. Something strange. Maybe I'm getting a little backwash from dinner. And the man of God said, some of you are tasting like a copper in your mouth. He said, it's not copper, it's either gold or silver. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And so he said, why don't you ladies that have compacts, little makeup pouches with a mirror in it, begin to hand them around to see who had their teeth changed from normal to something gold or silver. So the pastor's wife, she pulled hers out, she was looking in her mouth, and she said, hmm. And she handed her little mirror to me, and I looked. And again, God's man of faith and power looked in there, and I thought, in disbelief. You know, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of faith to get a miracle when the glory is in the house. The glory will supersede your faith. Sometimes we preach faith, faith, faith. We need to preach the glory. The glory will set you free and increase your faith level. It's an impartation that you didn't pay for. But after you get it, there's a responsibility. And I looked and my teeth had turned silver. But they were so bright, they were shining like gold. We don't know what they are, but they look like white gold. And as the service went on, others started to sparkle on the bottoms and on the top. Where I'd had dental work done previously, God began to miraculously change those things and all the tooth pain left my mouth. See, it's not about gold or silver. It's about whether you've got a problem and he fixes it. Amen. Amen. But thank God for gold and silver. Because the gold and the silver is mine, declares the Lord. And why would he put it in your mouth? To show you that if they can put it in your mouth, they can put it in your hand. So you can use it to meet the needs of other people. Because he doesn't just bless you so you can be in the blessing club. He blesses you and does it to you. And then he does it through you. You are blessed to be a blessing. If you want to be more of a blessing, release the blessing that's in your hand. And make room. That's good. That's good. Come on. That's true. That's right. So I got gold teeth or platinum teeth or silver teeth. I don't know. I went to the dentist. And my dentist is a Christian in a good Baptist church. But see, that dentist had come to the prison a couple of years before I got out. And he had chronic back pain. By the way, the dentist is a man of God. He really is. And he's a deacon at his church. And he came to visit the prisoner 
to obey the word of the Lord. That Jesus says, I was in prison and you came unto me. When you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. When you did it not unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. Amen. How many prisoners are you writing that you know? You need to know some. We've got about 7,000 on our mailing list. In a thousand facilities, state and federal, get in contact with a thousand facilities, state and federal, get in contact with us at Heart of America Prison Ministries, and we can give you the Holy Ghost hookup in the Pin Pal program. Amen. There's always more that can be done. Amen. So here, what happens is, I got these gold teeth, and I looked, all my pain went away. I had an appointment with the dentist. When the hygienist came in, she looked in my mouth. And she says, hmm, that's interesting. She cleaned my teeth. The dentist came in. He began to look in because it had already begun to get spread abroad in the office that something had happened. And so he knew me. And what had happened at the prison is he got healed of a chronic back problem five years earlier. And see, he learned not to speak against the things of God. Because when he walked into his Baptist church on a Wednesday night to give glory to God for what the Lord had done in him, the first thing he did was say, I had an interesting testimony. I went to visit a prisoner the other day. Well, first, they kind of backed off the fact that he would even go do that. When he reminded them of what the scripture says, they're like, oh, that's a nice thing that you did. But when they found out that instead of him ministering to the prisoner, God, who had endued the prisoner with power, had ministered that release of impartation to him and his chronic back problem that they prayed for every Wednesday night for months and months and months to no effect, but only to more Advil and Motrin. And he got healed instantly, and he began to give God glory for what the Lord had done. You could have heard a pin drop. They looked at him like he had five heads. How could this thing be? Number one, we don't believe that happens today. I don't even know why we have prayer meetings if we don't believe it happens. Let alone through a prisoner. See, it doesn't matter what you were. It matters whether or not you had an encounter with the risen Savior. Because the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be changed into another man or woman. And in silence, he was in his Baptist church on a Wednesday night, and what happened was they finally said, does anybody else have anything to share? Thank you, brother. So when I sat in that medical chair in the dental office and he looked in my mouth and saw something he'd never seen as a dentist before and he knew I'd not been to another dentist, he said, David, if it was anybody else. <laughs> I said, have you ever seen anything like this before? He says, nope. I said, what do you think about that? He said, amazing. I don't bet he went and shared it on Wednesday night. See, sometimes you got to not share certain things with certain people because they're not ready to handle it. Are you ready to handle it? Three weeks ago on a Sunday, I was in church and a woman came forward for prayer because she had tooth pain. Because God does it to you and then he does it through you. Amen. See, there's a message here. This isn't just about gold teeth. It's about a God who is mighty and wants to relieve suffering in the earth with his children. Heal them up so they can go forth as testimonies and witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. That's it. And a woman came forward for prayer and she had tooth pain. And I laid my hands on her. And the power of God came on her. And I said, that's it. And I turned and walked off and went back to my seat because they called me up to pray for her. Saw her on Sunday. She said, Pastor David. By the way, you can just call me David. I'm not into the times. I said, Pastor David. I said, yeah. She says, look at my teeth. 
and she had the exact same color that I had. And God had completely healed her. She hadn't been able to eat on that side in three months. She couldn't even chew, according to her testimony, and her husband's testimony who was with her, couldn't even chew sugarless gum. But the minute the power came on her, she went and ate immediately to test it out. And all the pain was gone. And somebody said to her, there's something shining in your mouth. <laughs> But she didn't believe him. See, when the glory comes, you don't even need faith. It's a little different message, isn't it? It's true. No, there's faith that brings healing, but the glory realm brings miracles. Because somebody is operating in the gift. Praise the Lord. So her granddaughter, three days later, said, Grandma. She said, Yes, honey. She says, what is that shiny stuff in your mouth? And she said, I don't know. This is the second time I've heard this. Once from adult. But sometimes you hear the voice of the Lord through the mouth of babes. She went into the mirror and she looked. And there it was. And she had platinum or white gold or silver. It's just real shiny. And all of her tooth pain went. Not just on that tooth, but on all of them. God does a complete work. When... We make room. You know the story. We're not going to go there. We're going to close and we're going to move into a time of prayer. How many want to get an impartation from the Lord? We're going to ask the Lord to bring the glory. Saul was breathing out threats. And here's what happened. He was going 180 degrees in the wrong direction. He thought he was obeying God with his religious spirit. He had obeyed the 613 Levitical laws down to the jot and tittle. He had memorized the Pentateuch by age 7. He obeyed those 613 Levitical laws, the 365 do nots, and the 248 Jews. And he followed them and followed them and followed them, knowing he was serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When in reality, he was doing just the opposite. Sometimes in your religious activities, you can be doing just the opposite of what God has called you to do. It's about relationship. It's about love. It's about fruit. It's about caring for people, not winning a doctrinal argument. See, when you're operating in true faith in Christ, you know you're standing. You're not moved by people when they have doctrinal arguments. Now, I think you need to know your word. Yeah, right. But when you walk into the realm of the kingdom of God, you look down at the problem spiritually. Not down at people. You look, but you look down at the problem. You see, that's a small thing. See, when David looked at Goliath, he saw him differently than everybody else did. Everybody else said, that guy's too big to hit. David said, he's too big to miss. Yeah. But you better have heard from heaven before you go after that one. See, church kids and kingdom kids are different. Church kids are converts. Kingdom kids are disciples. Church kids sit on the sidelines with their pom-poms. They pay for their tickets and they come to the game to watch the kingdom kids play. The Israelites in the wilderness were church kids. They got their daily manna. They got their water from the rock. They walked around in circles for 40 years. They went to church on a daily basis. But they had to rely upon a kingdom kid to hear the voice of the Lord for them. Kingdom kids hear the voice of the Lord personally and release the kingdom. You can go to heaven as a church kid, but you can't release heaven as a church kid. God wants to move you from a church kid to a kingdom kid so you can release the kingdom and bring heaven to earth that signs and wonders might be done in the name, the power, the authority, the character of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That people might know that you've been with Jesus because the works that he does, they flow through you. Impartation in an instant. Saul was on the road to Damascus. 
breathing out threats to murder some more Christians, thinking he was doing God a service. But there was a man named Stephen who flowed in signs and wonders and miracles. And when they martyred him, these are the words, and this was the prayer that he said that got Jesus' attention that caused him to go down and meet that person. When you've got somebody who's a ravenous, grievous wolf coming against the people of God, somebody's got to take a stand with love. Not just with another doctrinal argument, but with love. And this is what the scriptures say. We're closing. It says that Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Only time in scripture that Jesus is not seated at the right hand of the Father. St. David, why? Why? I believe that the reason Jesus was standing was because Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. As he's getting stoned to death and his face is glowing like an angel, they're gnashing their teeth at him, thinking from the religious perspective they're doing the right thing as they're pelting rocks at him and chunks of his skull are crashing and blood is flying. This man says, Lord, do not count this sin against them. And Jesus stands up and I believe he looked down and he said, Dad, Look how much of me is in him. Have you been transformed? See, when you squeeze an orange, you know what you get out of it? Orange juice. Not necessarily. You get out of the orange, sometimes a little worm. Sometimes there's some sour juice in it. Sometimes there's some rancid stuff in it. Is it the squeezer's fault? No, because the squeezer only revealed what was in the orange in the first place. When circumstances squeeze you and you act like a church angel and a street devil, don't blame the person and say they made me do it. No, they were just the squeezer God used graciously to reveal that which was in you so you could get into the cross and get it out of you so you could get more of him say make room. Uh, Have you been changed into another man or woman? And so Jesus says, Dad, let me, this is my vernacular. This is my depiction of the story. Read Acts chapter 9. If I'm wrong, adjust back to the scriptures, please. But here's the way I see it. He says, Dad, look how much of me is in him. He is so committed to me that he said the same thing I said on the cross. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. He says, Lord, don't hold this charge against them. Let me go down there and meet Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. I've got an impartation for him. And I'm going to change him into another man. And we are going to utilize him to write two-thirds of the New Testament because there's somebody on earth that we're going to take home because they walk with me so well, they're going to walk no more for God's going to take them like Enoch. Stephen had an Enochian walk with him. He was so sold out that Jesus says, we're going to answer his prayer. Praise God. So Jesus meets Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And let me share with you what happened. I know you know the story. But Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and knocks him off his high horse of pride and blinds him with the light. And Saul of Tarsus says, who are you? See, when you've got the love of Christ in you and you do not render evil for evil, but you turn the other cheek, it messes people up. And they say, who is that in you? How can you do that? And Jesus says, I'm going to visit them and reveal myself to them because there's enough 
of me in them. You're willing to die to self. You're willing to die and be martyred for my name. I'm going to go out and save them and change them and turn them into another man. And turn them into another man. And Jesus said to Saul as he was blinded by the light, he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. See, when you really walk with God, people better not mess with you. Not because you got a knife or a gun or a throwing star or you got a black belt in martial arts, but because you got a Jesus who will leave heaven and show up on the earth and visit someone in such a way that they'll get blinded by the light for a season until they repent and come unto him and they become just like you. Say, make room. Yes. And Saul left his Damascus friends and began to serve Jesus. Some of you are going to have to leave some of your. Don't say it too slow. But if you'll leave those friends that have gotten you into the thinking that will cause you to turn against the things of God, you'll walk away changed. Tonight, we're going to have a time. Our worship leader, Brother Smith, are you available? Or did he? Yes, please. By the way, got a round of applause for our Brother Smith. This brother has a worship anointing, and I don't think you've heard it yet. I think he was warming up. Because when he worships and just plays those keys in the background, I heard him when he came in. It was so anointed. It was like a Lyndall Cooley from the Brownsville Assembly of God revival years ago. It just brings in the presence. The prophet and the minstrel, they flow together. Brother, before you leave, can we pray for you? Okay, we want to pray for you. Can you feel that presence start to build? Dance in there. He rides on the wings of worship. Thank you so much, sister. Appreciate that. God rides on the wings of worship. There's things you can get from God only by worship. There's Thanksgiving. You can do it at a football game. Clap your hands. There's praise. You can do it at a rock concert. You might be out of order if you're a believer. But worship does something that nothing else does. There were ten lepers and they got healed. And they were healed as they were going. And one when they realized he was healed, he turned around and he came back to Jesus. And he fell on his knees and he began to worship him. And he was made whole. There was a Canaanite woman who came to get demons cast out of her daughter. Who was grievously vexed with an evil spirit. Matthew 15, 22, read it on. She couldn't get the miracle from the disciples. Jesus wouldn't even answer her a word because she was a Gentile. She was outside the covenant. She didn't qualify. The only time that Jesus ever turned somebody down for a miracle, the only time he said no for healing because she was outside the covenant. When she worshipped him, her worship caused him to supersede the covenant that was in place. Supersede. Things go above. 
See, the law of gravity is real, but the law of aviation will supersede it. Worship will supersede your sickness. Worship will supersede the bondage. Worship will supersede your financial situation. Worship will supersede the relationship that's been broken that is irreparable. Worship does something in the heart of the Father because you're no longer seeking that which is in His hand. You're seeking that which is in His heart and it moves Him and it causes the law to be superseded. The law of sin and death is superseded by the law of life in Christ. Some people stand, some people sit, some people dance, some people roll. Some people sit stoic. You do your thing with God. Samson would shake himself and the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him. David would sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and make melody in his heart unto the Lord. When I read the word of God out loud, the Spirit of God comes upon me. It's different with every single person. So you don't have to fit in to a religious mold. Do what God has called you to do with full liberty because you're not amongst people that are religious you're in the midst of people that are in relationship it's time to worship it's time to worship you may have been told no before in prayer but worship opens the door to a new Kairos moment that changes the atmosphere. You go from Clark Kent to Superman when the Spirit of God comes upon you. That kryptonite that's been around your neck, I see it and I clip it right now and I speak deliverance. That weight that has bound you, I break the chains right now by the name that's above every name. The name of Jesus. Go in or be gone in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, show me what you want to do as we worship. As we worship. As we worship. As we worship drug addiction, I break your power. No longer abstinence in your life, but deliverance. I crush that serpent of sorcery's head right now. I declare that shoulder to be unfrozen, that, that spot. There it goes, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. And the knee right now. Be free, be free in the glory, in the glory, in the glory, in the glory, in the glory. Worship, 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 worship. You get things from the Lord when you worship Him. Because you're not seeking Him for the things anymore. You're seeking Him for Him. And when you have Him, you become adopted afresh. And he begins to release yes. to you as sons and daughters of God. Kingdom kids that go forth in his name, in his character. Knowing not just his acts, but knowing his ways, his manner of doing things. I declare a fresh measure of the voice of the Lord to be heard in the ears of the saints. As you sleep tonight, dreams and visions I release. Dreams and visions, prophetic revelation. Dreams and visions, dreams and visions. Begin to put a pen and paper by your bed and prepare. Make room for the incoming Lord as he begins to invade your dream life and speak things in the wee hours of the night, opening your ears and sealing your instructions. He'll wake you with dreams. He'll wake you with songs in the night. He'll wake you with songs in the morning. He will open your ears. And he will give you the tongue of the learner that you might know how to speak a word in season unto him who's weary. He'll begin to show you the real issues in people's hearts. And once you know what's in a person's heart and what they've been through, you won't be angry with them anymore. You will love them with the love of Christ. You'll see them in a different perspective. You'll have heaven's vantage point. And you'll no longer look down upon your brother or your sister or an down upon your brother or your sister or an unbeliever, except when you're leaning down to help pick them up and to dust them off and to put them back on their feet. 
blood covers a multitude of sins. It sets the captive free. If you don't know Jesus in a personal way, if you don't know him in this way, he desires this for every believer. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47, there was a river that flowed from the sanctuary, and it was ankle-deep water. And he went down another thousand cubits as he measured, and it went to knee-deep water. And he went down another thousand cubits, and it was waist-deep water. And he went down another thousand cubits, and it was a river that he could swim in. Was the water in the river deeper, closer to the throne, or deeper, farther away from the throne of the sanctuary? It's deeper the farther you get. Paradox. Why? Because you don't need the anointing when you're in the presence of God. You need the anointing when you're in the presence of devils. Because the anointing is not for you. It's through you to cast out, to heal the sick, to set the captives free. And if you don't have a strong anointing on your life, hang out at the throne until you get the presence of God in relationship that will prepare you and he will send you to go into all the world the gospel of the kingdom with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost making an impact on a hurting, lying, dying, dying, blind world of destitute humanity in need of a Savior. If you want a fresh impartation, come up now. Pastor Dan, Pastor Koziki, would you come forward? And would you begin to lay hands with me? Thank you, brothers, but continue to play. Glow in the Lord and the song of the Lord. Use your liberty. Use your liberty. Make room. Make room. Empty out the water. Don't get a mixture tonight. Get emptied out and get filled to overflowing. Get filled to overflowing. Pastor Koziki, would you come forward and begin to lay hands on Pastor Bowler? Would you come forward and lay hands on? And Pastor Koziki, anybody else that you feel led to come lay hands on? There's work to be done. You know your congregation. You know those that labor among you.